We are finally here. We are finally at the castle. Let's go. The castle is built into the cave wall. Faded gold, white stones, inbuilt beside dark stones and sparkling red crystals. There are intricate designs and murals carved into its sides, and you see large stained glass windows depicting the dawn. It is immaculate, beautiful, and it feels terribly lonely. Your footsteps echo on the bridge. The castle is high above the city. You cross the bridge and you look down and oversee the entire city as it sleeps. There are no guards at the wide castle doors. The doors open easily when you push them, although they loudly creak. You step inside. The front room reminds you a lot of Tori's home in the ruins, although a touch more upscale. There are numerous candles that cast a warm glow around the front room, and the flooring is a golden mosaic with a red outline. The walls are a grey black which only makes the golden floor pop out more. When the front door shuts behind you or you're enveloped in silence, there is another set of wide doors in front of you and a hallway to your left. You think you hear whispering to your right. It tickles your ear. You turn your head to your right. You see a long dark hallway. There are no lights down it. You need to use the soul if you want to see ahead. You could have sworn you only saw one hallway when you first entered the castle. Perhaps you missed it due to how dark it is. Maybe, or maybe this is a ghost hall. Maybe Ka the spirit of Kara summoned it and she's like, Ooh, I would make this up here. Either that or maybe the castle comes with ghost hallways and perhaps that's where Asgore came from. He literally came out of thin air. That being said, <clears throat> you've gotten pretty good at calling on your soul. It feels as natural as breathing to you now. It's hard to imagine your life without being able to call your soul. The hallway has a thin layer of dust over it. You see cobwebs on the ceiling and wrapped around empty candle holders. Your flats leave little prints in the dust behind you. There's another tickler in your left. You turn your head to it. There's a door. Well, there are many doors down this hallway, but for some reason you're compliant to stop by this door. Open it? Yes, open it. Your orange light illuminates what appears to be a small bedroom. There is one bed pushed off to the side. You see toys scrawled across the floor and a toy chest filled to the brim with stuffed animals at the end of the bed. I mean, that's pretty sad. The fact that he, after all these years, the kid's room has been left untouched. Like, the toys haven't been donated. Like, they haven't, like, they haven't moved on. Asgore, like, hasn't let go of the past, and that's why, like, everything is left as it is, meaning he's still consumed by that grief. There's a dresser at the back, at the back wall, and there are photos lining along it. You step closer to it, intent on looking at the pictures, but you feel a tug in your sweater. You look behind you. There's nothing there. You frown. You feel something small and cold grasp your hand. You freeze. By the time you turn your head to look, you see nothing there. But there is something in your hand now. A gold locket. Your indigo eyes widen as you realise this is a locket to go with the chain. You pull the chain out of your pocket and sure enough it's a perfect fit for the clasp. Oh, how romantic. The locket feels out of style before you were born, but you've seen them in movies and read about them from books. You're supposed to be used to carrying a picture of someone you love or at least someone who's in your heart. Your warm centre and you hold the locket in your hands. Um, you can't help but think you'd like to see a picture of all your friends inside. How sweet. Click. There's a clicking sound from the locket. You unfurl your hand and it pops open. A soft gasp escapes you. Inside the locket is a flickering image that's constantly changing between one friend to another. Oh my god, are they all in there? I was thinking it was going to be like a group photo, not that every time the picture will like magically change for like a different person. That is so cool. Your heart warms and you hold the locket close to you. Your lips turn up into a smile. I'm glad. You startle from the whisper and you look around but you don't see anyone. You you thank them for the chain and the locket and you think it's time to leave the most definitely haunted room now. Thank you, Kara. I'm assuming it is Kara. If it's not, then Asgore and Tori need to tell me who the other ghost child is. Hmm. You have another kid, who is it? Well, where else are you hiding in your closets? Thank you. You're welcome. You go back to the front room. You look back down at the lock and admire what you see. It fills you with joyous bubbles and determination. You go down the left hallway, or you go through the front door. 
or you could go through the front door. After a moment of thought, you decide to go through the front door and head further into the castle. This was a mistake. You push open the door and are greeted by a long corridor with black and red tiles. You walk down it, your flowers making a quiet click sound with each step. You look around as you continue. It feels mostly empty. Hello, human. The voice comes from behind as the doors are shut behind you like something out of a horror. It's another goat monster. It's not just another goat monster. It's the <clears throat> goat monster. He is massive in stature with grey fur. A black beard and dark armour that glints gold in the light. His red cape flutters behind him as he strides closer to you. To you two. Again, who's you two? Is my, does my locket count as an entity or is that just a typo? On his head is a three spiked gold crown. Your eyes widen. You greet the king of monsters and politely introduce yourself. He stares at you with golden eyes and red pupils. He looks away, dismissing you. I know. You give him a tensive smile. Do you wish to leave? He asks. The barriers behind the castle. I won't stop you. Huh? That surprises you pleasantly. Your smile widens and you thank him. Sun spared you for a reason, he says in response. If I do not trust my judge's ruling, I would make for a foolish king. You are foolish! <coughs> Who said that? I'm just saying. You are foolish. Regardless of whether you trust Sans or not, you're foolish. You've got issues. This is why I totally agree with Ezreal sucker punching you in the face. You're clearly not enough of a threat to excuse you. I'm not even a threat. The only threat around here I see is you. Mister, I, th I summon trains and fling them at you. That is nice, you suppose? You... You don't think you are a threat at all? Perhaps not in direct combat, he says. Go on, leave. Oh, really? What am I mainly dead to you? Something does not feel right to you. You hesitantly ask the king what he thinks of this world. It is kill or be killed, he flatly states. So why spare you? You are not worthy enough to expend the energy. Oh, you are just rude absolutely freaking rude i can show you i am worthy because even papyrus said i am smart enough for him to fight your brown frows you do not think this is the complete story is there something wrong with the barrier is it possible for anyone to cross the barrier the king shrugs it has never been designed to detain a human soul humans can pass freely through it you point out that monsters could too if he destroys it. Something that will not happen. You ask why. Why? He repeats back to you, coldly amused. Why does a mother protect her children? I am the king of monsters. I must do what I can to protect my kingdom. By literally making them as miserable as possible. Because literally everybody's freaking miserable down here. Because you can't let go of the past. Even though it happened like centuries ago. This is why you get sucker punched. But humanity is no longer a threat to that kingdom. So you claim your words are pretty human, but that's all they are. Do not waste your breath. Leave before I change my mind. No, because I'm an idiot. He barks out a laugh. You refuse my mercy, the audacity. Your arrogant truly knows no bounds, says the rude ass goat, who literally said that I'm not even worth it. Really? <laughs> it's not about arrogance. It's not even about you. He's the king of monsters. You understand and respect that. But as a king of monsters, surely he must do what makes his people happy. And they're not happy. They're freaking miserable. You've seen the truth of this kingdom. You've seen their despair. You have been here a day, he sneers. Hold your tongue or I'll cut it out. Ah! Eh! Freaking threatening me? How freaking rude! I have done nothing to you. All I did was just state the truth. You know, technically, I've been through a lot for one day. I've had many death experiences. I can tell you, I saved and died. I saved Alphys. I, I helped Flowey. I saw some getting tortured. I've seen a lot of stuff I shouldn't have seen for someone of my age. And now I've seen a fully grown freaking monster goat threatening me. To cut out my tongue because... I said something he didn't like. He didn't like my opinion. 
Hmm. Uh, it's a free world, you know, people are allowed their opinions. You raise your head and change me to gaze. It is common sense to help someone in need, and these monsters need your help. It is in a save or be saved world. It is time you save them. You are filled with determination and you tell the king, freaking no. And what does he do in response to you talking to him? At no point did you like raise a weapon of mass destruction or throw anything at him. His response to you saying no was he launched a ball of fire that had gone through in seconds killing you. Who's acting like a little spoiled brat? Who is acting like a child throwing a tantrum? Who is not acting like a king of monsters but more like a little kid who just had his favourite toy taken off him? You, sir. You have issues, sir. You need to have your issues sorted and it's nothing to do with me. But anyway, now it's time to fight the goat man who's going to keep throwing a tantrum. Okay, kids, let's do this. You roll to your right as soon as you say no. The fireball goes past you and slams into the door. You ask us why in the world does it need to be violent? Why, he asks. He raises his right hand and summons a trident. Why? Excuse you. What in the earth? I asked you a freaking question and you respond with like, why? It's trident time. Whew. There's no reason to it. It already is. Oh, really? Oh, oh, really? Really? That, that's what you're gonna... Mm. All the more reason to change. If it is violent now, let it turn peaceful. Gosh, I'm having more of an issue with him than I am with Sans. Asgore's eyes narrow. He throws his trident at you with incredible speeds and you are immediately impaled. Oh, for God's sake. At least with Sans, I'm so used to it by now. I'm pretty much nullified. But when it comes to Asgore, because he doesn't always like attack you depending which route it is. Yeah, I'm peeved at him right now. Like dying ever stopped you anyway. You roll to the right as soon as you say no, blah blah blah. And you in a chain of violence, blah blah. You keep his gaze coming, blah blah blah. Here we go. You keep it. You keep his gaze. Huh. Your confidence is almost impressive and went so foolish, says the king. You could say the same for him. There is no folly about my views. It is the honest truth. Close your close your cl close your eyes to it if you wish, he says. This world is kill or be killed. The night you will experience the Oh my goodness gracious me. He's like Child, you will die end of discussion death to you <laughs> But then when it's his own kid he won't do it, will he? Hypocrite. Oh god, oh god, oh god. Uh, 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 now we need to dodge him. Um, um, uh, when all else fails, quick, go to the right. Go to the left. Um, 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 I, I, I literally was guessing then. Um, um, uh, go under. Oh god, will you stop? Calm down, when you wretched god. Okay, so now we're gonna go. I'm gonna go to 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 the the, the the right. The train slams into the ground beside you as you hop up. Asgore looked at you coldly. I see now how you managed to survive. You're agile. Well, yes, thank you very much. I'm really good at dodging. You know, I I learned a few things from Sans because he kept killing me 174 times. I got a lot of exercise in. You just had a lot of practice since coming to Enderfell, mostly in Judgment Hall. A day's project means nothing in the face of a hundred years worth of experience, Asgore rebunks. What about 176 deaths? You smile. King Asgore misinterprets you smile. You think you can survive this? Yes, but I will die, but I'll come back and then you won't even know. Ha! He rushes to you and kicks you hard in the stomach. Rude! You grasp the floor to try to stop yourself, freaking asshole goat. Mama, even Mama Tori wasn't like physically violent with me. Pfft, don't like you. Your hands drag against the tile. There's enough force and friction that you feel bits of your skin getting peeled off from your palms. Thankfully, you're able to sew yourself enough that when you, you do hit the bat wall, nothing breaks. Asgore jumps you and you scramble to get away from his landing zone. He hits the floor hard enough to send a small shockwave and the floor shakes, causing you to stumble. He raises his side. Oh, um, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Left. Oh, freaking left. Um, b b b uh, b uh, b uh, b between. 
You burst through the volley. Only the barest hint of your sweater touches the fire and it is seared off. Hey! Stop breaking my freaking clothes. You don't want me being freaking naked now, do you? Asgore spins his trident. Hmm. <laughs> you tell him you don't want to fight him. That is not up to you, he says. Yeah, because clearly you're the one who attacked me. I did nothing but disagree with you. And your response was freaking attacking me and showing me violence. Who? Who is the problematic person here? You claim humans were violent. Excuse you. I did nothing to you when you attacked me. Hm. You are no different than the humans that came here. I'm just saying. It's not, you're not so different anymore now, are you, Asgore? Actually, it is. It is your choice, as it is his. He glares at you. You oversimplify this situation and disregard the truth. This is a kill or be killed world, he points to you. Your hands may not be stained red, but this only by sheer luck. No. No, he snorts derisively. That's not by luck. It's by choice. It's by your determination. You will never harm someone. You unflinchingly meet his gaze. Heck, I even had a freaking bat with nails in it, and I had literally a weapon. I didn't hurt anyone with it. I could have used it to beat the poop out of you. But hey, look at me. Pacifist all the way. I may bite, I may bark at times, aka say things, but I will never become violent with you. The past cannot be changed, but you're in the present can. His eyes narrow. It is not a kill or be killed world. It's a save or be saved world. And that includes Asgore if he freaking gets the stick out of his butt. You see the bareless flinch in his shoulders and he grips his tight and tightly. You wax a nice tail. However, it is useless in reality. There is no hope for change. Not for anyone. Shake your head. That's not true. And why do you... Why do you think that? You give him a grin because you were already talking to you. It was truly no hope. He never listened to you and just freaking keep killing you over and over and over and over again like freaking sands. You send your hand to him. It's not too late. It's never too late. He can make peace now. He can lead his kingdom to service and give them happiness. Ha. King Asgore looks at your hand with an unreadable expression. You. And instead of doing the smart thing, which is take my hand and say he's sorry, he chooses to be a child. He raises his trident and lowers his head. You will no longer meet your gaze. I cannot, he says. Goodbye, Twinkle. It's not that you cannot, you just choose not to. Because you're that freaking stuff and you'd rather everybody else be freaking miserable than give them the goddamn happiness they deserve. And let it go of your own freaking grief. He conjures the second trident and then throws it at you. Oh, blue my neck. What's going to happen? Who's going to save me this time? I haven't romanced anyone. Oh, God, who's going to save me? And it never touches you. A pillar of fire erupts from the ground as it is thrown and knocks it off course. You and Asgore looking surprised as none other than Mama Toy marches into the room. The goat monster's golden eyes are burning with ferocity and pure anger because Asgore dead. Dead try to kill her child. Adopt your child, even if she technically hasn't even said that. Regardless, I'm still adopted, so pfft, there we go. And she's not alone in her march. You see many monsters beside her. You see Froggy and Napsabook, the dogs from Snowden, Chiron, the children in Metal Waterfall, Metatron and Staff, and the Royal Guards with Papyrus and Die at the lead. Even Sans is there. I'm kind of a little sad to see that in the friendship route that Grillby isn't mentioned by here. But then again, Grillby's route was added after the fact, so maybe it, there is some way to have Grillby pop up here too? I don't know. There's so many of them. They fill up the room and surround you all. Enough is enough, says Tori. Tori, King Asko stares her in blatant disbelief. You came back to me. No, she coldly rebuffs. I came for the human, for Twinkle. She raises her chin and glowers down on Asko. And for monster kind, you take one more step towards that woman and you will have to face me. Go, Mama. Go beat him up. Go, Mama. Go, Mama. Yeah. And me. The dogs howl in unison, holding up a stick. Sharon's saying, Sans, no killing Twinkle Band. <laughs> Don't worry, Sharon. He's not going to kill me anymore. It's okay. It's okay, Sharon. Sharon just got a little triggered like I do. It's okay, Sharon. It's over, says Sans, giving a sharp to be grin. We're tired of this, so unless you want to have a hell of a time. And also, seriously, Shiren, I'm not going to kill Twinkle anymore. Sans, no killing Twinkle, Bab. 
Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. You better not make that an album. I will. Damn it, Chiron! King Asgore looks at the monsters around him. Not only them. Says a voice that feels familiar to you. The monsters part ways to make room for a new monster. He's a goat monster with bright golden and red pupils, like Tori Nazgul. Trailing behind him is none other than Dr. Alphys. Tori gasps. Ezreal? Oh, um, hi, says Ezreal. I wasn't expecting to see you here, mother. Tori rushes to him and immediately hugs him. Ezreal? King Asgore's expression darkens to weariness. Is that truly you? It is. He says, awkwardly pan Tori's back. I see you still haven't trimmed that awful beard of yours. Asgore's eyes widen and he silently grins and strides forward. My boy, my son. One awful, one awkward family hug at a time, he complains. And besides, we're about to tell my friend. Friend? You look between Ezreal and Dr. Alphys. Wait, Flowey? Howdy, Twinkle, says Ezreal. He gives you a grin. Glad to see you're okay. Um, you are okay, right? Yes, you run to hug him. Tori notices and opens up her arms so that you also hug Ezreal, your adopted brother. Ezreal hugs you both. You seem a little changed. You sure you're okay? Honestly, I need vacation after this, and probably I need to replay your route just to see you smack out score again, just to make me feel better. Yep, good. Says Ezreal. Now, if you and mother will excuse me, I need to talk to father. Tori squeezes Ezreal, and she reluctantly lets him go. You also let go. Ezreal steps closer to his father, King Asgore. Father, it is time this feud with humanity comes to an end. It's time the monsters return to the surface. Ezreal. No! Ezreal cuts off. This isn't an argument or something up for debate. You won't win this. You can't win this. I understand. I understand the war changed you. I know those memories are hard to let go, but it's time. Don't stop us. Twinkler has shown us that humans and monsters can be friends again. Let us try. Asgore stares at Ezreal. He smiles faintly. I cannot win this. Why does it take your freaking son and your wife to show up for you to ask goddamn listen? Does this mean this could have been resolved had these two shown up sooner? Human, no, Twinkle, you said the world does not need to be killed or be killed. Do you truly believe this? You gaze at him in absolute dumbfound disbelief. It's not kill or be killed, it's save or be saved. You smile at Asgore and it's time for him to be saved now. Then so it shall be, he utters quietly. He drops his toes then finally and you kick it and yeet it across the freaking room. You literally just go over to the window and you're like, whoo! You're not gonna eat that anymore. And he's like, my trident! You're like, no, bad! No trident for you for a month! And while he's not smiling, you think he is happy. Now there's only a couple of things left to do. You tug on Ezreal's sleeve and he looks at you and smiles. Yes, my friend. You tell him you need to check up on a friend. You'll be right back. Um, okay. You slip into the void. The hands are on you in an instant. They grip your face, your arms, your sides, your hips, your legs. Hello, dear human. The destroyer house bounces in your head as you sink further into wrongness. You think it's gone easier to hear the voice. However, it takes you a moment to find your voice in the sea of cold, inky blackness. You also ring a dings if he has any idea on how to free himself. I'm so curious as well. Would, does, like, ring a dings have, like, any PTSD from this? Like, did this affect him, like, in any way? Or, like, how exactly Sansa and Pirates really coped with the day that, like, the brother disappeared and stuff? I mean, they must have been, like, really dramatically affected here, you know? But I've said this before, like, there are, like, different things here that make you, like, wonder, like, how mentally each character is. Papyrus especially, I mean, him killing the human for a first time probably was kind of, like, a, like, a jaw-dropping, like, opening experience for him. Something that he's, like, probably regrets, since he, he definitely is softer at heart than some of the others. Now I think about it, I don't think Winged Dings would probably be too bothered by the idea of the void. I mean, he'd probably be like, oh, maybe I should go in there again and explore. <laughs> I, need, I need more more for my research. And sounds like, fuck no, you're coming with me, you're not going in there again. But brother, no, you're getting tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, bad. I'm pulling my, I don't want to be using an experiment card. 
Uh, but brother, no. Get out of jail card. That means I get out of your experiments. Mm. Okay, where were we? Oh yeah, okay, so first of all, I want to point out something. There's like a weird noise you're hearing in the video. I only now, as I was watching the recording back, did I notice that the sound of me twirling my hair um, could actually be picked up on the mic. So this noise, that's me twirling, like curling my hair, just twirling it with my fingers. That's what that noise is. In case you're wondering, that was me literally messing with my hair. <laughs> so sorry the mic picked it up. Anyway. The hands are on you in an instant. They grip your face, your arms, your sides, your hips, your legs. Hello, dear human. They distort our bounce in your head as you sink further into wrongness. You think it's gone easier to hear the voice, however. It takes you a moment to find your voice in the sea of cold, inky blackness. You ask Wingadings if he has any idea on how to free himself. Yes, that's great. Is there something you can do? Yes, I need your help. He's got it. What does he need? We must first go to the barrier, and then I will need to borrow your soul for a brief period of time. You shiver as he talks, the void pressing on you in every direction. It's almost too much. You do your best to bear with this discomfort. You like a little more of an elaboration on that. I will use the power of the barrier to free myself, but a human soul is required to enter and leave the void. I need yours as a beacon. That makes sense, you think. It's harder to focus the longer you linger. You agree. The barrier is behind the castle. Take the hall on the left and follow the path. Do not cross the barrier. There is an extra enchantment. It's a good thing that Gaster is fully aware there was an extra enchantment. Otherwise, can you imagine if I walked right into that? Because Black did me, probably. Hold on. Hold the phone. Does that mean Asgore knew there was an extra enchantment? Would that have killed me? Would that have also me killed? Dark petals, would that have killed me? Did he just try to kill me? <gasps> did he just think really try to kill me? Oh my god. If you did, Asgore, pfft, shame on you. You like to ask more, but your soul aches from the Void's touch. You must leave. You gasp for air as soon as you leave. Azriel and Toriel are beside you in an instant, both looking deeply concerned. Biscuits, you hate that, but you have to do. But you know what you need to do next. You'll need to catch your breath. Once you feel like you can breathe properly, you explain your need to use the barrier to help a friend. Ezreal and Toriel give you an odd look. Okay, says Ezreal slowly. I trust you. Come on, I'll lead you there. I'll follow behind you shortly with the other monsters, says Toriel. I need a few words with Gare. You and Ezreal nod to that and leave. Ezreal takes you out of the room and down a hall. A left hallway. As you walk down the hallway, you admire the paintings. All of them were hand painted and depict pretty environments. They range from mountains to oceans to the night sky. You wonder who painted them. There are candlesticks in the walls. A crimson flame flickers to life as you walk by them. They must be of the magical equivalent to autolites. How neat! The hallway, this hallway, you are pleased to note, is not covered in dust, grime, and cobwebs. At the end of the hallway is a door. Ezreal pushes it open and you're pleasantly surprised to find a magical garden. Beautiful yellow, white and orange flowers blossom around a brick path. There are tall trees with golden leaves and orange coloured rose bushes. There are lampposts with yellow tinted magic crystals. The lights are mimicking that of the sun. Although it is without warmth, the path winds around the castle and is built further into the cave. Noise hums all around you as you approach it. And when you're close enough to get a proper look, you see a wall of white. This is the barrier, says Ezreal. What's next? The next step is to let Wingazings borrow your soul. Oh, biscuit! You have to go back to the void! But this could be the last time you fervently hoped. You won't give yourself... You don't give yourself time to warm up. You're excited to be done with the void forever. So you fall straight in. And into the hands of a friend. Oh, into the hands of a friend. Yay! You got a friend in me. You slide into the pool of darkness and tell Wingy Dings you're at the barrier. Thank you, my dear. You ask him what you need to do next. Please, show me your soul. That's something you can do. You're actually really good at it now. You present your soul. The hands move to grasp it. Oh, you want to flinch away from their touch. It's like ice on bare skin. You don't take your soul away, however. You certain, you're certainly wants to leave the void as much as you do, after all. 
the hands tighten around it and you feel something. An echo of magic, perhaps? There is a reverberation of noise in your mind, first tangled and messy, but not for long. There's a sensation of being enveloped entirely by the faint magic. You can no longer feel the wrongness of aid, only the magic, his magic, wingedings. You sink into it, body and soul. This will only take a moment. It takes exactly one moment. There's a warm breeze against your skin, and when you open your eyes, you're no longer in the void. The magic that enveloped you is gone, as is the barrier at last. Did it work? It did, my friend. You turn around to face the owner of the voice. He sounds very tall, as tall as Papyrus, if not more. He's like Papyrus. He is a skeleton monster. He has vivid red eye lights in his eye sockets and skeletal hands with holes through the palms. He wears a long black coat that goes to the ground. It doesn't look normal. The ends of it wave and flicker like candle shadows. Underneath the jacket is a red turtleneck sweater and black pants. He has a crack in his face, one split from the top of his skull and goes through his right eye, and another cracks from his left eye and goes down to his spiky mouth. This is Wingy Ding's gesture. You give him a bow. You make a move to step closer to greet him properly, but your legs give out from underneath you, and you fall forward. Wingy Ding catches you with ease. There now, pulling a monster out of the void is taxing for his soul. Using the same soul to funnel raw magic to accomplish that is doubly so. You should take it easy. You thank Wingy Dings for catching you. You do freely remark. You do feel remarkably tired, like you'd finish a marathon. You look up at him and give him a smile. You would change your smile. Not a problem. It seems like a small thing compared to what you've done for me. You have no idea. Wow, says Ezreal. Twinkle, I feel like I shouldn't be surprised by the miracles you perform. Yet, I still am. I am still pretty surprised. If you could do me a miracle again and, like, shock it to Asgard, greatly appreciate it. I know, I know, Asgard is good now, but maybe getting one little punch in would be okay, right? Wingdings chattel. An impressive human, is she not? Ezreal grins. Yeah, I'm glad to count her as my friend. You're happy about that too. Once you are steady on your feet, Wicked Ding sucks back. Now, if you don't mind, I will excuse myself. I have a pair of brothers to find. Sons and Papyrus are like, oh, Look, it's the asshole! Sans, be nice to our brother. No, it's the asshole! Bro, he's been gone for like 20 freaking years! Ah, true, I should also remain angry at him. So I shall. Right, where was I? Uh, let's see. Winding takes the bow and leaves you and Ezreal alone. Are you tired? He asks you. You admit you do feel something. I feel tired too in real life. Tired feels too small of a word. Exhausted, more like it. Then here he says, he picks you up brighter style. Let me carry you. He bumps his forehead against yours. It's only fair, right? You carry me. Then he notices a locket around your neck. Oh, where did you get that? A ghost child. What? Never mind. I would, it'd be really cool as well to get like a scene with a ghost child where you go back to see the ghost child or something. Or like the ghost child appears in the surface world because like, I mean, everybody's going to leave the underground. So Kara's just left there in that room. Or maybe they move on. Who knows? I can only imagine. Never mind. The magic in the locket shows who's in your heart, says Ezreal. His smile softens. I used to have a matching one. May I see inside? You open the locket and show Ezreal the picture inside. His smile softens. In that case, he holds out a hand. There's a distortion of magic in the air and the locket that matches yours materializes. It falls into your lap since he's carrying you. How about I wear this one? We can match. Oh my gosh, so Ezreal's gonna put his locket on? You ask Ezra to be sure. Yeah, you're my best friend. Besties! Yes! Everybody gets, you get a locket, you get a locket, we all get lockets! And Ezra's like, I'm gonna wear this so that way I can match you because you're my bestie. My dearest one, says Tori, as she and Asgore approach you, are you ready? You and Ezra exchange joyous looks, yes! After Twinkle, the course proceeds to materialize tons of lockets and literally sticks it on every single monster. <laughs> mine, 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 mine. Anyway, 
Together, you and your monster friends leave the underground. Oh my god, we've nearly finished the friendship bread. Oh my goodness gracious me. You feel strong enough to walk as soon as you smell the fresh air. Ezreal gently sets you down. He keeps upon your shoulder in case you need help. It's darker side, yet brightening with every second, and you hear a gasp from the monsters around you. You're choked by sobs. You hear oohs and ahs and whimpers and hiccups. You hear them whispering and speaking to one another as they all exit the underground to stand on the ledge overlooking the mountain. The barrier had been at a cave entrance. There was a wide overlook that showcased the forest at the bottom of the hill and the city that rests at the edge of the forest. Tall skyscrapers. Why do I hear two sets of music? I muted the tab because it sounds like there's two sets of music, or is it my imagination? Okay. Regardless, we still got a story to read. I don't remember where I was. I read some of the, here we go. The monsters know it's some point to look at, their voice is getting louder, and then all goes silent when the first crack of light peeks out from the horizon. No one speaks, no one moves. It is the first sunrise, and they catch it. They catch it? They watch it in complete silence. When you look around, you see many of them openly crying, their tears falling down their faces. Some have collapsed to the knees, holding their hands over their mouths to keep from weeping out loud. You smile, your own eyes burning. Yes, this is it. It's not a kill or be killed world. It's a save or be saved world, and you save them. You enjoy the feeling of the morning sunlight on your face. It looks like you've been trapped underground for almost a full day. Your determination carried you through without rest. But now that you see the sunrise, you feel your whole body relax. Exhaustion starts to press upon you, and you sway on your feet. Azrael supports you, a knowing smile on his face. Dear human, must be tired. <clears throat> Dear human, must be tired, gently remarked Tori as she moves to help support you. Her golden eyes are filled with warmth as she looks at you. Ah, mama, understandable. Oh, shut up, dad. Quietly says Asgore and he stands behind you. Hey now, hold on now. Nearby, but keeping respectful distance. Good, finally, some respectful distance. I don't forgive you at the moment. You yeeted a freaking spear at me. I was just having a discussion with you. It's going to take a while before I'm comfortable with you. Sans, at least, I don't expect any less from Sans at this point. <laughs> Get some rest, Twinkle, says Ezreal. You more than deserve it. Yes, we aren't going anywhere, says Tori. There's no rush. We have such a beautiful view. When they put it like that, you slowly sink to the ground. Ezreal and Tori sit on either side of you. Oh my god, I'm adopted. I know they didn't technically voice that, but I can pretend for my own liking. You close your eyes and lean into Toriel, completely at ease. Pleasant dreams, Twinkle, she whispers. Yes. Pleasant dream, dear Twinkle. Your journey has ended and you have more than earned the rest. Sleep well with your new friends. When you wake up, know that you'll be ready to face whatever comes next. No matter the obstacle, no matter the enemy, no matter the battle, you will okay because you are you. True happy ending, friendship route. Okay. It really seems like everything has worked out for the best. Your journey, your struggle, none of it was in vain. You saved them, all of them, and you didn't make it out alone. The Gasters finally moved to the surface right next door to you, and your new home. As a VIP ambassador, you had to move into a magically secured home of your choosing in the city. You and the Gasters see each other daily, although you aren't the only monster you see often. Most notably, Azrael's becoming a huge part of your life. He became the new king of monsters, thank freaking god, and helps you integrate the two societies. You are dear friends at work and outside of it. He also gives the best hugs. You spend time with Tori and Asgore every so often. Tori bakes you a special pie and loves to give you hugs. You hang out with Papyrus and Metaton and Undye. Papyrus and Metaton? <laughs> Papyrus and Undye. You are a semi-regular on Metaton's new TV show on the surface. You attend all of Sharon's concerts and are the first to buy her new album, Sans no killing twinkle bath. <laughs> you visited the school in Ebot City where the monster kids started to attend. They enthusiastically introduced you to their new human friends. 
You had to talk them out of tramping off of another waterfall with their new friends multiple times. You meet up with all the dogs from Sun every month for a game of poker, which you suck at a lot. Everything as it should be, everyone is happy, and you're the reason for it. Thank you, Twinkle. Thank you for falling into Underfell. Thank you for showing them kindness. Thank you for staying determined, and thank you for being you. The end. The first storm bonus scene for Friendship Rap Peeps! We're here! We made it! At last! We're at the final stretch! And then I need to literally go back and just show you what the neutral ending looks like. Who knows? Either way, let's go and check out the bonus scene for the Friendship Route. It is the very first thunderstorm to come into Tiara since the monsters have returned to the surface. And as soon as you saw that weather forecast, you immediately insisted on getting your friends together to watch the storm. The gasters have a nice wide living room with a magnificent window at the front. It's the perfect place to watch. The monsters were amused by your enthusiasm and agreed. Most of them never been through a storm before. They have rain when water leaks down the stalactites in the marshes, but it's always gentle and refreshing. The storm was supposed to be intense, the first severe one of the year to signify spring's approach. You were so excited to witness their reactions. An hour before the storm arrives, you get snacks and drink and are all prepared when you head over to the gasters. One of the benefits of being neighbours means your trip doesn't take too long, thankfully. Good day, tiny human! Papyrus greets you at the door. He merely offers to help you carry your armful of goodies. What is all this for? Exactly how long is this storm party supposed to last? Sans asks warily from behind Papyrus. However long they want it to, you tell them. While you hope the monsters will be interested in the storm, you've prepared a scary movie to watch with it going on in the background. It's not your favourite movie, but the scares make it well suited to watch during a thunderstorm. Great, because I got plans tonight. Says Sans, Grilby is testing his menu tonight. Free of food, booze for all taste testers. I wonder what kind of bonus scene Grilby's gonna get. Ooh. Because that one can get pretty spicy. If, if you thought Gaster was spicy, Grilby is even more spicy and hotter. Quite literally. <coughs> Moving on. You step into their front room and take off your shoes. Weedings and papyrus need a clean home, or they will turn into grumpy bells. The Gaster family home is well kept and is a strange collage of intense, edgy, dark, and so minimalistic it's cynical. Uh, it's clinical decor. It's hard to tell which brother chose what, it's all very them. Papyrus and Sans fall behind you as you enter their living room. Wingeding stepped out of the shadows as he normally does. Greeting you with a smile. Hello, my dear. You beam and open your arms for a hug and wing ding chuckles as he obliges. It's good to see you again. You saw her this morning, Sans says dubiously. Wing ding's eyes narrow. Your point? Boys, come on! Why the need to greet her like it's been ages? Are you trying to get on my nerves, darling brother? <laughs> That's the tone you're taking with me, you impulsive dumbass. You, you clear your throat. Both go silent, thankfully. You step away from Wingadings and ask your companions if they would help you get ready for the storm now. Of course they agree. They have no other choice. At your insistence, the gasters help move the furniture. They turn the couch around to face their huge living room window. Wingadings takes down the curtains to ensure an unobstructed view. Papyrus grabs more pillows and blankets to make a cozy sitting area around the couch. Sans levitates the table into the room to set the food and drinks down. So him to just levitate things. By the time the air is set up, the next guest arrives. Ezra is first. Your best friend enthusiastically greets you with a nuzzle. My friend! You hug him tightly. Hello, your highness. Ezra beams. Hello to you as well, Papyrus. Thank you for the invitation. You step away from Ezra to let him come inside. Scarcely a few minutes go by before the next guests arrive, and I and Alphys confidently strive into the Gaster's home, though probably Alphys is like giving Gaster some looks. Attempted murder, I'm watching you, you better be playing favourites with me. You better be sneaking a couple things at the table for me. Otherwise I'm going to tell the diner and I will tell your bro, you don't want to deal with your bro. You knew they would come, and I is friends with Papyrus, and Alphys is friends with Wingerday, <laughs> her attempted murderer, and Sans. But you hadn't expected a third guest to join them. 
Metron swoops in. Darling! Metaton! You have to hug Metron, especially when he opens his arms especially for a hug. It was thanks to his help that you were able to reach so many monsters. And I also feel like, probably as well, it's partially due to us interacting with Napster Book. That's why Metaton was so keen to see us as well. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with Napster Book. So probably Napster Book said about meeting us since we met Napster Bloke early on in the ruins. So it would be interesting to see that drought with Napster Bloke. I may or may not have a soft spot for a ghost. That being said, where were we? Where, where were we indeed? I was just reading something. Oh yes. Um, inspired them to come to the surface. That forever placed him as one of your favorite people. Metaton pats your back and kisses both of your cheeks and you usher Metaton inside with the others. Papyrus quickly shuts the door, quietly, not and quickly probably, shuts the door behind you. With Manitron's arrival, there's only a few minutes left until the storm is meant to arrive. Everybody sit down, sit down. Hi, I'm so excited, even though technically I'm never included in this adventure, so I never get to use the Tammy voice. It's okay, Tammy, you're there in spirit. It's gone dark outside, remarks Sendai as she glances out the window. That's normal, right? Yes, since everyone's here, it's time for everyone to grab their seats. You sit in between Ezreal and Sans. Yeah, because someone has to literally be in between these two. Because if I don't, I imagine there'd be a fight breaking out in between either lightning flashes or the bangs. Like, once everything's at peace, you just see, like, something. It's going to be a remark. Either Ezreal's going to do a remark to Sans, or Sans is going to say something. But I feel it's probably going to be Ezreal. And then a fight will break out. And then I'm just going to be like, ah, great being a referee for kids again. That's what I normally do. Sans levitates a bowl of chips over to the three of you to share. That's so nice. Look at him making friends. I guess he's not so bad for a smiley trash bag. Flowey. Ezreal. Sorry. The darkness of the storm overcast rivals out of the underground. Are you sure this is normal? Metaton asks you. It looks like night. Yep. Alpha says, from what I've read, it gets dark because the clouds are blocking the sun. Isn't the sun supposed to be the brightest star? The sun is a star, Sans explains. It's also hell far away. Anything big enough uh, in between us and the sun will block it. There's one thing to read about it, Wingedings remarks, but seeing it in person is a different experience. Yeah, agrees Sans. Bose didn't mention the smell either. He can smell it from inside? Sans has an excellent senses, Papyrus says. His hearing is superb. Sans coughs, a red tint under his eye sockets. Ugh. Which is why it's so aggravating when he does not utilize his full capabilities. Oh, come on, boss, Sans complains. Papyrus' eye lights like shine brightly. I'm not wrong. There is nothing more frustrating than seeing a talented monster waste his time. You have no excuse to keep that up on the surface, and so help me if I catch you slacking at work, or if I catch you drunk or mustard. Though so that would be pretty funny, having to deal with Sans when he's drunk. Why you gotta compliment me in the same breath you threatened me? Listen to your baby brother, Sans. Winged Ding chides. He only wants what's best for you. Ah, uh, go, Sans. If you ever get tired of your work, you're more than welcome to help me with mine. I'm pulling my I want to live card again. Sans, I would never put you in a dangerous situation for my job unless, of course, it's down my route and I find out that you've done something to my date mate. Then I will happily put you in harm's way. Mm. Bro, luckily this isn't the romance route, right? So I'm safe. Yes, but I will remember. When you're doing schools. What if I paid you? Ezreal wonders out loud. When you're doing tilts his head. How much are we talking? Hey, what the fuck? Sans loudly asks. You see he has a grin on his face. You ask if any... If everyone would please spare Sans, he owes you many, many, and you intend to collect... Why does he owe you so much? Ezreal asks. Uh, no reason. Sans coughs. Yes, no reason. Ha, Sans. The first strike of lightning shoots across the sky. It's close enough that it lights up the entire room. At once you hear gasps. Sans' eye light shrink as his sock is wearing. What the fuck? Metaton gasps as Alphys yelps. Stars above. Huh? Goes Wingedings. And then the thunder claps. 
It's a massive storm, and the thunder that comes from it is powerful enough to shake the house. Whoa, says Ariel, that's neat. What the fuck was that? And Jai demands, Sunday explain. It's harmless, says Wingedings. You notice Sans and Papyrus have immediately moved to sit beside Wingedings. The elder scaffster places her hand on each of them and says, It's okay. It did not sound harmless, says Papyrus. Is it normally so loud? Ezreal asks. It can be, you answer. He frowns. I may need to buy some earplugs then. That already hurt my ears. Oh, you have some noise cancelling her from your place. You'd offer to grab them. That does not sound like a good idea, darling. Frets Metaton. Is it safe? Ezreal asks. Definitely. Hmm. Ezreal considers it. If it bothered me too much, I'll grab them. Is he sure? You don't mind. Ezreal smile. You said it's safe and I trust you. That being said, there's no reason for you to get wet in the rain. Ah, uh, you promised to go with him. But best friends get soaked in the rain together. You don't make the rules. He laughs. Ah, you see, okay. You offer him a high five. Yes! High fiving time! Yay! I like high fiving with him. So funny. You offer him a high five and he slaps your hand against yours. Lightning flashes again and you count out loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Boom! You tell him the storm is eight miles away. The storm isn't even here yet? Alphys asks. Nope, you explain that we're on the outskirts. Huh, says so Sans. All weather this intense on the surface? Oh no, this is very mild. This is mild? And I asked an alarm? Stars above, no wonder you were fucking fearless. You chuckled. You and the monster sit at the window and watch the storm. As it would turn out, you had no need to bring the movie. They were captivated by the lightning, rain, and thunder. And when the storm passed hours later, everyone agreed to watch the next one together. Yay! We did it, everybody! Woohoo! That's it, everybody! We did it! That was the friendship route! Let's see. So, at the end of the day, I died 176 times, adding more rights, and I, Napsa Blue, might have maybe more. Napsa Blue, I'm looking forward to Napsa Blue because when we first started playing, Napsa Blue had a heart, which made me honestly believe that Napsa Blue had an active, like, romance route available. So I was like really excited and then I found out he didn't have one <laughs> and I was a little bit sad. <laughs> um, let's see, adding more options to explore the city and waterfall more. Oh, that would be so cool. I'd love to explore waterfall more on the city, like to see like Muffet maybe or gosh, Tammy, give me an excuse to use my Tammy voice. Let's see. Added bonus content. I'm going to need to write down how many bonus scenes I've done. Either way, that was the friendship route. Now, I'm not sure how I'm going to tackle the neutral. If Hello, my little stars. It's me, Twinkle, from the future. So, I can tell you right now, what I ended up doing was putting all the neutral endings together in one video. A huge, huge thank you to Tarpel16 for helping me get the Judgment Hall ending. There was some little bit of issues happening when I was trying to get the last ending to show up, but um, I reached out and I asked and I was given very important information and also a little quick little adjustments here and I got it working. Got it recorded. Thank you so much. And also thank you for all the wonderful comments you've been leaving. I have not gone on to responding to every single thing. That being said, everyone, we are going to be covering more of Death's Tale. I've still got some endings I need to of that. We're going to be going down Mafia Fella Confirm right now. Since everybody wants it, we're going for Sans first. And of course, we're going to be tackling Underswap. That being said, there's one more video to go up. Now, not only will this video include all the neutral endings that are currently available, but also an extra scene I found for Mama Tori, which I didn't get the first few times I went through. Either way, I hope you guys are enjoying the series and hopefully I will get to do even more videos on this in future. Who knows what the future has in store. But again, none of this would have been possible without Dark Pal 16. This has been such an adventure. I have loved every second of this and would happily do it all over again. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video.